Welcome to this discussion organized by Tsarvena Mladina, or also known as uh, Red Youth, on the occasion of the International Youth Day. Today's event is dedicated to one of the most important roles, roles that young people play in today's society, rebelling against imperialism. In the world we live in, imperialism represents the domination of one of or several nations over the others through economic, political, and military power. It is a fundamental system of exploitation aimed at suppressing the independence and freedoms of peoples. At the core of imperialism lie the interests of large corporations and the military industrial complex, which use state apparatuses for their profits, regardless of the human costs. NATO as a military alliance represents the highest state of imperialism. It is the instrument through which imperialist powers impose their own will on peoples around the world, waging wars for resources and geopolitical and uh, guising geopolitical interests as security and democracy. Herein lies the task of the youth to oppose this system and fight for a new and progressive future. We are the ones bringing the, new, the energy, creativity, and vision for a different world, a world of peace, justice, and solidarity. This is why we are here today, to discuss how to organize, how to expose and fight imperialist policies, and how to build a movement that represents the interests of the peoples and not corporations and armies. On my behalf and on behalf of Tsarvena Mladina, thank you for being here today. I urge you to actively participate in the debate as every contribution you make is important in our shared struggle. I will, uh, I'm now going to move on to the introduction of our uh, panelists today. We have people from five different European countries, namely uh, Macedonia, Ireland, Norway, Romania, and Italy. Um, I'm going to uh, firstly introduce our uh, comrade from uh, Romania. I'm going to, uh, so uh, Dave, David A. Marin uh, is, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Lupu Ion Nicolae, sorry, uh, is the vice president of the Union of Socialist Youth. Uh, and uh, these, uh, they are the youth wing of the Romanian Socialist uh, party. Uh, Lupu, could you maybe give us a little bit of an introduction to your own political party, your activities, and uh, something similar? Sure. Uh, so, uh, my party was uh, initially founded, you know, in about uh, 1991 after the Qatar Revolution by some ex cadres of the party that were more uh, socially progressive, so to say. Um, I joined uh, in about like five years ago, maybe six uh, years ago. Uh, we we usually uh, try our best to uh, to talk with the worker movements, with syndicates, um, even um, associations that I think compared to America are like team tanks uh, to us at least. Um, we we also uh, try to. Um, we we do our best to keep in uh, memory that that we had a socialist past and it was in uh, by by most margins better than today or the the previous before it was uh, brought to us um yeah that's uh, that's pretty much it where we uh, to to remember our past we do manifestations on uh, on specific days we remember our uh, previous examples of socialists and, and so on. Thank you, Lupu. Uh, we're moving on to our two comrades from Italy, Samuel Sodu, the National Foreign Affairs Officer, and uh, I'm sorry if I butchered this, Marco Cantiani, uh, the Foreign Affairs Officers for the Balkans. Uh, and uh, guys, comrades, could you tell us a little bit about your movement, your organization? Okay. Thank you at all. Uh, we are from uh, the Young Communist uh, Movement. Uh, it's a uh, young section, uh, youth section of the uh, Refundation Communist Party. It's uh, the party uh, that uh, was alive after uh, the split with uh, the part of uh, Social Democratic after the fall of the uh, 
uh, that one, feel free to read. Yes, uh, of the before uh, of the big communist party of Italy and uh, how uh, our party been through uh, in uh, mo uh, moments of uh, up and down in, uh, in this year, but uh, we are yes, still uh, still alive. And this yes, is very uh, our party and our youth movement uh, organization, sorry, try to keep alive the communist uh, um, political and moral uh, values in Italy. Uh, we are trying to keep alive keep alive the, um, the fight side side by side with the working class and uh, we try to oppose the neoliberal uh, politics and neo-fascist politics in Italy because now in Italy we are very complex situation where uh, where the uh, so-called central left but they, they not our left they uh, join an alliance with the neoliberal and uh, fascist movement and they are working together to sell uh, the country to privatize everything so uh, our party and our youth organization are trying to stop them it's a very uh, difficult uh, situation and uh, also very... for, from the imperialist of the united states yes of course it's uh, a lot in italy uh, in our uh, uh, institution, but maybe we can speak uh, about this after. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you uh, for your introduction. Uh, we're going to move on now to our comrade in Norway. Uh, we have the other Nikolai Petersen, uh, and he is the current leader of the Young Communists in New uh, Norway. Yadar, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your organization and activities? Yeah, um, well, we are the youth wing, as most of the other ones here are, of the, uh, our party is the Norwegian Communist Party, uh, which was founded in uh, 1923 out of the Norwegian Workers' Party. So we had our cent uh, centenary uh, last year. Uh, so Congratulations. Uh, it's... Uh, it's a bit difficult to say the story of our youth communist movement in a bit because we had a little bit of a falling out with some members that we ended up the, sadly losing the name that we had from all that time. Uh, not for the entire communist party, but for the youth wing. Uh, so um, in 2009, I think we got the constellation that we have today, the name of the youth communists in Norway. Um, it's um, to say what we do it's uh, it's a lot of the work that has uh, been do done in the communist party is being done by youth uh, because we have as many other communist parties around the world quite a lot of older members because of the world political situation that made the we made communism more in line with the how uh, in line with the how people viewed their uh, daily lives before in a way there are there's a, been a bit of an alienation between the working class and how things are uh, at least after the 2000s and especially with the fall of the soviet union in the 1990s and so on so we have that little bit of an age gap which means that we have a, we do a lot of the things that needs to be done for the communist party and so forth we are not really uh the things that are exclusively done by our youth communist movement is a is a little bit more into our parliamentarian work uh and which is a bit weird compared to a communist party uh, we're not really a parliamentarian party and so we have like a parliamentarian duty as a uh, as a youth organization somehow um, other than that we are trying our best at uh, waking up youth no matter if we if we move someone from the far right a little bit more to the left and someone from uh, the middle to the left then we're doing a good job in a way instead of just focusing on getting people exclusively to our side it's more trying to 
stop what is happening in the world at the, this moment and the, the influence Norway has on it, uh, especially through NATO and uh, arms production, which I hopefully will get back to later in this. Yes, of course. Um, thank you, Yadar, for uh, your introduction. Um, we're going to move on to our furthest away geographically uh, comrade. Uh, that's uh, Alex Homitz. For, uh, he's a member of the National Executive Committee of the Co Irish Communist Party. Uh, Alex, uh, take it away. Tell us about your party and your activities. Hello, my name is Alex Hammets. I am the former General Secretary of the Connolly Youth Movement in Ireland, and I am now a member of the National Executive Committee of the Irish Communist Party. We ourselves went through a, a schism, a split, a breakup, call it whatever you like, uh, based on a number of different political reasons. So politically, we are in a process of regroupment and identification of the political reasons underlining the split. Our practical work tends to focus on working in people's and mass organizations. A number of our members, myself included, would be trade union organizers. We believe that only through the economic organization of our class can we reorientate back to what actually matters, which is class politics uh, and bring sections of our class with us to fight? And through that process, can there be a growth in the repoliticization and redevelopment of a culture of collective struggle, industrial struggle and class oriented struggle? All things I would suggest are entirely missing, particularly from English speaking countries. At the moment, Ireland is in the unique position of both pretending to be neutral, but simultaneously um, the idea of neutrality being accepted by a large chunk or group of the population that sees neutrality as something almost sacred and part of Irish culture. So on that front, even though Ireland does facilitate NATO and is occupied by the British state and the six counties, there is a very widely held understanding that it is better to be neutral than to be a part of uh, the NATO bloc. Uh, this understanding has come into large friction and contradiction since the genocide in Palestine has been unleashed. Ireland, as some of you may know, is one of the most pro-EU countries in Europe. But the obvious question has arisen for lots and lots of people as to why the EU uncritically supports the genocide while purporting to be an advocate of human rights. This, alongside the double standards in the war in Ukraine, I think have presented opportunities for us as communists to make a very clear anti-imperialist articulate argument that not only does the EU need to be broken up, but Ireland's future as a unitary 32 county socialist republic as a nationally liberated country, uh, as a country that strives to build socialism in one country is outside of the European Union. On the subject of anti-immigration, I think this work is connected to trade union work and political and organizing work. Sections of our class are drawn to the emotions of anti-immigrant activists. And what one of my comrades likes to say is that the far right have got the emotions right, but the politics wrong. And what he means by that is that a lot of representatives of left wing politics come across dreary, boring, dispassionate and not courageous, you know, particularly groups like the Trotskyists. They want everybody else to do the dirty work for them, but they will not get down into the trenches and do it themselves. So we have a number of running battles. Um, I could probably speak for about seven hours, but I'll leave you there. Thank you, Alex, so much for uh, your for the introduction. And now we're going to go to our very own uh, Todor Katsarov. Um, he is the first secretary of Tsarvena Mladina, and he's currently the coordinator of uh, the security sector of the political party Levitsa. Todor. Uh, tell us a little bit about Sarvena Mladina, the Red Youth. First of all, thank you for the great introduction. 
the red youth is on the forefront of the fight for a better future, integrally mobilizing young people and showing their true defiance against the capitalist system. Through guerrilla actions and advocating for a policies that truly target young people, like the housing law that we proposed in the parliament, which our comrades from the left are members, we are uh, the 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 punch the the punching stone in the great capitalist system, the big capitalist system, basically. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Todor, for uh, the introduction of Red Youth Cervena Mladina. Um, so now we will move on to the planned discussion uh, for today. The idea is that we're going to be talking about the three topics today. Uh, one is geopolitics, another is youth, and another is uh, communism and future perspectives. So I would like you all to chime in uh, to the discussion. I will um, I will start by asking this question to our uh, comrade to Romania, uh, Lupu. But feel free for anyone else to chime in for if they have anything to add to the, their answer. Um, so Lupu, how? How does the imperial imperialist NATO alliance affect the geopolitical geopolitical developments in your region? Uh, so our um, affiliation to NATO, as of late, has uh, has uh, imposed onto us to have a pretty uh, familiar or uh, even cordial relationship with our near uh, neighbor. Um, be, uh, before I can actually give you the picture, I think I, I would have to give you some context because we are uh, Romania is bordering Ukraine. It's almost close to the to the contact zone. We have a shared history with the Ukrainian people and also with the Russian people. And a lot of our um, my compatriots uh, carry this baggage, this historical baggage either because of propaganda, because of education, or because they see some uh, signs today that maybe confirm their, their expectations. Uh, so Romania and Russia had, uh, had a, uh, a pretty uh, usual relation uh, with, uh, with Romania, like other uh, neighbors. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, my, my ancestors used to ally with one of our neighbors to uh, fight the other. Uh, this was uh, not something based on principle, more of, of on opportunity. Uh, this has, uh, at in about like the 19th century, has uh, landed on our head because Russia uh, freed us from the Ottoman Empire, but uh, felt the need to occupy uh, part of something that we consider uh, part of our country. Uh, that also um, after the the uh, russian revolution created some extreme tensions um, because of our uh, because of our conflicting relation with russia uh, the fact that they became became communist and we were a monarchy became uh, like a, an accentuator to that uh, to that tension um, also, Russia, at in that period of time, when they, uh, in my opinion, liberated half of my country, they had to also uh, handle the irredentists, the dissidents that were were preferring uh, poverty under the monarchy than uh, liberty under the federal republic, and that, of course, led to some uh, things that. We shouldn't uh, take an example of that, at least I think so. Yeah, at least not in our conditions. They had their, their own. Um, 
So uh, my ironically news in our country about the situation in uh, in the north came as early as uh, 2014 since the Maidan revolution. Uh, the news that were coming were about um, uh, minority persecution, not only Romanian, but Hungarian, Polish, uh, also Russian, obviously. Um, this uh, this also uh, added uh, was added by the Odessa trade union massacre. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that, but it's a it's a horrific page of uh, Ukrainian history. It it was, in my opinion, really a massacre. Um, this is this Maidan. The the Ma Maidan gang goes uh, further than Maidan itself. Uh, there was a war in uh, Moldova, in the Republic of Moldova, the Transnistrian War, where Romanians also fought alongside the Moldovians. And uh, uh, I, I think, as you remember, Russia was on the part of Transnistria, but also uh, ob one of the branch of the Maidan was a part of the, the Transnistrian government as well. And it wasn't the communist branch, it was actually the Ukrainian National Assembly, which is a fascist organization. It's a self-admittedly a far-right organization. Um, I think our our position right now in NATO, uh, we, we recently donated a, pat a patriot system to, to Ukraine, and we are surely, but uh, slowly but surely pushed into, into a potential uh, war either on uh, our land or uh, crossing over to Ukraine. That's that's it. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, sorry, maybe it's worth uh, also mentioning that during the, the Bolshevik revolution or in that time, uh, in that approximate time, there was also a massacre of Romanians. Uh, this is used by my anti-communist anti uh, country uh, to to push the anti-communist rhetoric that uh, some Romanians that ran from uh, what they considered Bolshevism were killed by border guards. Uh, the Romanian government and the anti-communists uh, usually insist that the border guards in Ukraine were Russian. Mm -hmm. So we this, this is like a, like handing glove to to demonize Russia further. Uh, but of course, our problem is currently at least not uh, not Russia. It will be. That, that's it. Thank you. Um, Italy is one of the core members of NATO, and it is very. It 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 is not bordering Ukraine. Uh, however, it is a, a part of uh, that alliance, which is funding Ukrainian arms uh, and weapons. Also. Uh, Italy is in a peculiar position in terms of the Middle East as well, where NATO also has had its uh, own hand in the uh, in uh, the creating of the state in which the Middle East is in right now. Um, could you maybe, uh, Samuel and Marco, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about Italy's uh, role in? Uh, NATO and the developments in your own region uh, in regard to the NATO and, uh, imperialist policies? First, uh, okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so first things, uh, the, um, the Italian government, first uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, have uh, had a lot uh, of uh, sovereignty uh, in uh, the Mediterranean Sea and uh, in the geopolitical situation. But after uh, when uh, the Soviet Union fell down, uh, the sovereignty of our country uh, are more and more fall, yeah, fall with the with, with, the, wall, with, the, no? with the wall. Yes, uh, and so now uh, we don't have a lot of possibility to uh, decide uh, the way. Uh, for our uh, sovereignty, yes, so we, we or, or in, in, uh, now, now we are like a puppet state. We can't uh, choose a independent uh, foreign uh, politics, yes. and uh, we are under the control of the NATO and American government. And uh, we can only for with uh, our government, of course, 
only follow the order of the of the NATO war, uh, war equipment. Yes, and uh, this, uh, our people uh, understand this. So uh, this is a sentiment, a general sentiment in our uh, population. Uh, you know that uh, our uh, base is also the basis of Italy because we have uh, a lot of American bases in our uh, in our land and also uh, our national bases. But also uh, uh, the, our national bases are used in, in this moment for uh, the uh, for like uh, a scale uh, position yes. for bombing. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Palestine or uh, yes, the, 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 the NATO war machine use uh, our country as a, a mm, launch station. Yes. For example, during the Yugoslavia war, uh, the NATO imposed to Italy uh, the uh, access of our uh, military bases and our, our sky for uh, bombardment of Yugoslavia. Um, during uh, during the terrible years, years of the Yugoslavian civil war, our our party was the only one in the parliament that opposed to that uh, war crimes against the people of the Yugoslavia Republic. But uh, uh, the NATO imposed to all uh, to all of uh, our parliament to uh, join the war against Yugoslavia and to destroy. Uh, this country. The same is for the war in Iraq and for, uh, uh, for example, in Palestine, yeah. Libya. Uh, so our country in Ukraine, in, too. In Ukraine of course, yeah, because uh, about uh, the, the Sigonella yes, uh, of course. Yeah. in Sicily. Yes, yes. So our country it is in a very uh, difficult position because uh, we are a puppet of a state, and uh, we have to win, uh, our government follow the American orders. Uh, now we are trying to explain this this situation to our population and to uh, show the fact that uh, the, the our politician that is slave that is slave of the Amer American politics they want only to sell our country they are selling our industry they are selling our um, for foreign independence. And uh, so we are trying to show that to the population that we have to uh, to find to fight against uh, the NATO imperialist war machine and the head of NATO that is the USA. We have a common enemy. We want to join the war, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the resistance against the imperialist war of the American imperialist war. And uh, we are trying to, as much as uh, we can, to help the the population, the the, the people of of, of oppress uh, from the oppress for, uh, by the American imperialists. In Italy, we are protest against the uh, the tentative the tentative of the NATO of the NATO to start a war against Russia to uh, start a war in the European continent and to sell uh, all, all, us, uh, all of us to, to die in Ukraine only for imperialist uh, uh, objectives or imperialist uh, goals. And in fact, we have, uh, uh, we have the reason of the people because uh, uh, if uh, you see the pools in Italy, the most part of uh, our population are against uh, sending uh, weapons uh, uh, for Russia or, or uh, uh, Palestinian situation. Uh, so we say that uh, um, uh, Italian state now is like uh, aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean Sea, but uh, not for us, for the uh, United States. So uh, the situation uh, of uh, uh, our national security of uh, our uh, sovereignty is um, uh, is in the same uh, place with the security of uh, Palestine, with the security of uh, uh, Russia, and the security of uh, Europe, and also the security of Balkan. Um, thank you for your uh, for your important answer. Um, 
we in Norway has also similar to Italy been an important player a, uh, in NATO in the past. Uh, the difference is that Norway is simply just not part of the European Union. Um, could you, uh, uh, Yardar, could you explain maybe uh, the position of Norway currently in NATO? What is your stance and your party's uh, stance towards the actions of NATO and so on? Uh, it's a pretty simple and it's a pretty hard question to answer at the same time. Um, we are, uh, as a party, I can say we are totally opposed to NATO and all of the things that NATO are doing, and we want nothing to do with them. Uh, when it comes to our role in NATO, on the other hand, as a country, that's a bit more difficult to explain. Uh, for instance, the leader of NATO for many years have been a Norwegian that in his youth actually um, was against NATO and demonstrated made his career about not wanting to have anything to do with NATO and then he goes and becomes the leader of NATO uh, and the things that he has consequently led Norway to do both as first the prime minister of Norway and then Later, uh, later as the leader of NATO, um, marks the biggest uh, traitorship of any Norwegian in history. We are currently um, one of the biggest uh, financiers of, Nor of NATO. Uh, for instance, Norwegian money being used to build military bases in Lithuania, while we at the same time have uh, had uh, um, installations monitoring the, the in the old times uh, the USSR and now Russia uh, and uh, more le recently we have um, many more military bases popping up that are American bases with American laws Norwegian laws do not count on these bases anymore um, we have uh, been used as a place for uh, stocking up with the uh, military material for the americans as the way that they did in uh, israel where they had like uh, several mountains where they put uh, american military equipment and uh, at one point probably uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, we also had several nuclear weapons come to, into uh, American ships sailing uh, and uh, while it was USSR we used to be uh, one of the biggest um, spy centers towards the USSR especially when it came to monitoring uh, Russian submarines so we have had a long history uh, after the Second World War uh, with the, when we um, received the martial help we were one of the poorest countries in europe and had the very little and to rebuild the country we the the people on what was supposedly supposed to be the left the, the workers party um, uh, said that it was okay to receive the martial help but one of the statutes of that was to say that we oh you have to be against communism even though there was quite a few people in the country that were actually quite fond of the uh, communists and especially the Russians because they actually liberated us. But then we received the American help, everything was Americanized and now the, our military more or less is geared for attack of other countries. Seen as the way that we participated, for instance, in bombing in Libya, which was decided in the Norwegian parliament over text messages. Uh, so there is quite a lot of things that we're doing there and also because we are one of the richer countries in the world uh, arguably the richest depending on which statistic uh, our proportionate funding of NATO both the ones that we say that we do and the ones that we don't really tell anyone that we do are extremely large so our position in NATO uh, and with the equipment that we have that are geared towards uh, attacking other countries, not defending our own, 
the boats that are part of American military convoys, uh, our Norwegian planes stand uh, like they are based in American Air Force bases. Uh, we have a very internationalized military. It's not so big. But since 1947, 120,000 Norwegian people, uh, military personnel, has been uh, participating in military operations in more than 40 countries. And that's pretty impressive for a country who has supposedly never been at war with anyone. Um, so our position with NATO at the moment is quite... We are, um, I would say we are all in at the moment, sadly, even though we know that uh, when we have uh, operations in Norway, that if, like, that's the one thing that we're supposedly uh, part of NATO for, is to protect ourselves against Russians. If the, we were ever to be invaded, NATO could never help us, because we have tried. Uh, we're through the different military operations where there, there have been chaos trying to get 15,000 people into the country. So it's uh, more being used as NATO's wallet for the moment on one side. And on the other side, uh, Norway is actually uh, one of the world's biggest arms exporters. In 2022, we were the world's fifth biggest arms exporter. So a lot of the bullets that are made for NATO uh, are made in Norway. The cannon systems, rocket systems, all of that. And also to our sovereign wealth fund, which is the biggest sovereign wealth fund in the world. We own a lot of uh, stocks, 1.5% uh, of all of the stocks in the world, which means that we are also invested in uh, arms manufacturing in other countries, not only our own. Um, and uh, for instance, now we have a ban of exporting Norwegian arms to Israel, but we are still exporting them through the US. And we own the majority, like the second biggest uh, in a report here the, that came out about uh, who were the financiers of the Israeli arms. We are the second biggest one in Europe. The problem is that the biggest one in Europe, the majority shareholder in that company is also Norway. So we have a pretty dirty presence around the world. It seems like... Uh all the, the the NATO countries are being used as military bases for the U.S. imperialist uh, interests. Uh, Italy is the aircraft carrier of NATO. Uh, Norway is the wallet and manufacturer, although Italy also, as far as I know, manufactures also uh, quite some weaponry. Um, Let's let's take a look at a, another example of a NATO member state which has recently joined and is trying to also join the European Union. Um, Todor, can you please tell us a little bit about uh, the experience of joining NATO and being a part of NATO in this very um, turbulent few years of the world? Yes, yes. Thank you for uh, for asking me this question. Uh, first of all, we believe that NATO is the extension of American imperialism in Europe. Uh, our country was forced uh, to join NATO in in a way that. Uh, there was a popular referendum that the people rejected it, and uh, contrary to to the UN charters, uh, we were we were we were forced to change our name, and then the traitors of our of our government joined the NATO under the new name, which the people are very against it. Also, the the situation in the Balkans, it's uh, very difficult thanks to NATO, especially because they are building bases all over the place. Uh, the biggest example is the one in Kosovo, which uh, through that base they are controlling the the whole 
re, uh, the whole region militarily and their projecting power uh, and for basically for for the balkans as you may know we are a melting pot, pot of cultures and uh, historically here the two civilizations were meeting the western one and the oriental one so there was a period in in our history when there wasn't conflict in this place uh, that was under communist yugoslavia which people lived in peace and harmony but the forceful dis dissolution of of yugoslavia mainly by by america and the uk and all the other western imperial imperialist states brought us to this unfortunate situation also in the i would like to mention the eu process because uh, here in in macedonia eu officials from brussels act in a way that uh, doesn't suit them uh, the they are acting like uh, co colonial administrators disregarding our sovereignty and our basically our right to civil de determination because they are they are forcing us to to adopt laws and stuff that are are unsuitable for for our common uh, economy and our country uh, the i think the 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 main spear against our country is capitalism and neoliberalism liberalism they are motivated by by that and uh, they are destroying they are destroying our country not just ours the uh, and like nato is the military wing of the imperialist cause and the eu is the soft power economic force thank you we have an interesting example here in the panel which is ireland ireland is not a part of nato however uh it is uh, in the midst of this imperial game that is being played by uh, the UK and its allies. Alex, could you tell us a little bit uh, about how do you view the fact that Ireland is still divided by games, uh, by, by such games? Yes, well, the ultimate irony of pro-NATO advocates in Ireland is that it's a NATO member that continues to militarily occupy Ireland, a fact that those who argue for NATO membership tend to conveniently overlook. I think in the last five years with the development of multipolarity in the world, it's created a sense of panic among the comprador and collaborator class in Ireland. So they have clearly felt the need to accelerate the process of integration into the general Western military bloc. Uh, if you took stories in the news, literally, you would think that the Russian invasion is going to happen any day now, and Ireland is next on the list. Um, the recent European elections saw a coordinated alliance of liberals, conservatives, and Trotskyists to remove two anti-EU and anti-NATO MEP members, Claire Daly and Mick Wallace, and, and they were successful. It was one of the most concerted and focused uh, interferences in, a, in an election, I think, that a lot of people in Ireland ever seen. On the other hand, then, statistics show that nearly the entire Irish economy is dominated by multinational capital. Uh, up to at least 10 companies are responsible for almost 85, 87% of all export and import. Legislation here is developed to be suitable for foreign direct investment, particularly with taxation rules. Ireland is well known uh, with the ironic name of a banana republic because it's an offshore tax haven for multinational corporations. Uh, capital is moved through here. 
uh, both shadow capital, which is capital that never even lands, but simply moves through legal structures in Ireland, and then real capital as well. So only yesterday, just to give you an example, a news article showed that Coca-Cola moved 33 billion euro tax-free uh, through a small town in Ireland straight to the Cayman Islands. So we, we have our place in that sense for the Western Bloc. However, these contradictions, uh, the usage of Shannon Airport since 2003, the challenges made to it, have rejuvenated the movement for neutrality um, in a very clear thesis, anti-thesis way that the because the voices for war and imperialism have gotten louder, lots of people who would be favorable towards neutrality have also been either activated for the first time politically or have reactivated to be involved in the struggle once more and put their mood forward. But you shouldn't, nobody should confuse that. Ireland isn't neutral. It hasn't been neutral for a long time. But there is a popular understanding of what neutrality means. And this is ultimately the challenge in Ireland, is that they are trying to chip away at Ireland's neutrality through a cloak and dagger approach where secret deals with the British Army are made, the transition of troops to Shannon Airport, where there are no checks to the planes and breach all sorts of international yeah. rules and regulations take place. So even though we, the political establishment present Ireland as a neutral country that can be an arbiter in different agreements, Ireland is firmly in the Atlantic Anglo-American bloc. It is totally politically aligned and the establishment and sections of the army do their very best to facilitate whatever is needed of them. Um, unlike most other Western European countries, popular opinion is heavily weighted towards the Palestinian struggle. Many people here correctly identify the comparisons between the Irish struggle for liberation and the ethnic cleansing by the British state and Oliver Cromwell. Uh, I think today is actually the anniversary of when the ethnic cleansing was enacted 400 years ago, 390 years ago. Um, so there is there are comparisons made in the consciousness of a lot of people in Ireland, uh, except loyalists, of course, who associate with Israelis. So that speaks for itself. Um, there are differences of opinion on the right of Palestinians to armed struggle, but really our collective impression is that only the kind of middle class NGO professionals and academics and what you could call the soft left are against the right of Palestinians to armed struggle, while the rest of us normal people uh, respect the right of Hamas to kill as many Israeli soldiers as possible. The role of communists is to identify that war, fascism, and the refugee crises and the immigration crisis, I don't think it's a real crisis, I think it's inflated, uh, are byproducts of the imperialist interventions. And a lot of conversations do tend to go that way. Oh, you're anti-immigrant. Did you protest the war in Libya, in Syria, in Iraq? Because the reason we have what you call an immigration crisis is because we are part of a block of countries that help destabilize and destroy the countries of these people. And this is an important uh, contradiction that we have to continue to raise and raise and raise. The political arguments that communists are presenting in Ireland uh, are, aren't just rooted in a ceasefire in Gaza or just neutrality, but it has to be complete non-participation in NATO, but also the European Union. The European Union is a bosses club. It is a club for monopoly capitalism, for war, if anything, it is the continued existence of a Western alliance of colonial powers who have rebranded themselves as lovers of democracy. After all, uh, to use almost liberal language, there's been no um, decolonization process of any of the major centers of power in the EU. If you walk through the streets of Brussels, you have statues of King Leopold, who is the equivalent of Hitler to those in the Congo. So for us, our role is to assume positions of leadership and inspiration for our class, to intervene in struggles like we always have in disputes and to fight for our class. But I would say that we don't have a widespread presence in our class. 
the role of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland has been extremely powerful for the last 100 years. There has been a changing in conditions since 2008, 2009, 2010. The church here, which would have exercised near uh, monopoly style power over how people perceived the word communism, was brought into disrepute because many of its sexual abuses were publicized. And the byproduct of that has been more than one generation of people who have broken with the Roman Catholic Church and have begun to look at things and political issues and social questions independently of the theology of the church. So what I would say is that there's a general sympathy to communist ideas. Um, and perhaps many of you have also had similar conversations, you know, where you speak to someone and you say, well, do you support public housing? Are you against war? And they say yes and yes and yes. And at the end you say, well, you sound like a communist and they kind of look at you in shock and they say, I could never be a communist. But in practical terms, most of our class agree with the political positions we put forward. So I would suggest that there is a clear space to develop class oriented politics or intervene in existing class struggles that are taking place. That is what our party does at the moment, besides the process of actually regrouping our political organization and party, our members would be involved in live industrial disputes with companies over privatization, over outsourcing, pay and conditions. Um, we have organized strikes. We resist evictions. These are the class bread and butter day to day issues that build confidence and relationships with people in our communities, our spaces and our workplaces. And we need those relationships to identify then broader struggles. In trade union terms, we say, you know, get the small win first and then focus on the big win. Don't start when you try to organize a factory or workplace by talking about, you know, a big wage increase for everyone. If there's no confidence among our class, it falls on us to build it. So in the metaphorical sense, you know, we focus on fixing the toilet door or getting new conditions for the canteen. And I think there's a parallel here to be drawn for building support for broader struggles. So in Ireland, that directly translates to rebuilding the confidence of our class, first and foremost, and meeting some of the material needs of our class, and then directly linking those struggles to the fact that, well, look, we have won this wage increase, but because there's no capital regulation, because there's capital flight, because our economy is built on foreign direct investment and our politicians support it, how can we ever truly resolve and meet the material needs of our friends, our families and our community members? How can we stop people dying on hospital trolleys because the hospitals are overflowing from underfunding and privatization? And this is where, you know, I, I, I quite dislike saying, well, the solution is socialism because it sounds stupid, you know, it, to the to your ordinary person. That doesn't mean anything. It has to be rooted in these practical things to, to say, well, after going through this process, the solution is socialism, that the only way to stop and sleep safely at night, knowing that your grandmother or your cousin or somebody who has an illness isn't going to die on a fucking hospital trolley in some underfunded and privatized hospital is through the development of a dictatorship of the proletariat that will exercise power on all our behalf and not on behalf of the people who sniff cocaine and play golf Monday to Friday. You put it very well, Alex. Thank you. Uh, I saw that uh, Samuel and Marco had uh, had their hands up in the chat. Uh, do you guys have something to add to the to what Alex was saying? Yes, uh, we want to add uh, one uh, more thing because uh, we want to. Um, now we are together uh, a lot of countries that are inside the NATO uh, war alliance and we think that it is very important to us to join our forces and to work together to uh, try to stop uh, try to stop and try to uh, fight against from a intern front against the NATO war machine uh, so for us, it's very important to build uh, a deadline of anti-imperialists inside the NATO bloc. And so we uh, want to um, thank you very much for this invitation and for this opportunity to 
talk with other comrades about uh, anti-imperialist, other comrades from uh, NATO and uh, uh, non-NATO country. <laughs> but for us, it's very important to uh, join the forces uh, to build an anti-imperialist alliance inside the NATO. We, we can uh, try to, to stop the NATO war machine but uh, we think it's very important to work together to build a, a, a united front against the, the war machine, against the imperialist action, uh, for, for, uh, for example, with a, a common action in the near uh, countries. Um, the key to uh, defeating such uh, powerful imperialists is indeed uh, organizing. Uh, Todor, I see you have unmuted yourself. Yeah, I would like to agree with my previous comrades or the comrades which previously said. I think uh, that uh, the the only way to fight anti-imperialism and NATO is cooperation. Uh, events like this and if the and maybe we can talk about uh, cu cultural uh, exchanges and stuff. In that way, uh, we we have to build a community of anti-imperialist forces that will w work together and uh, achieve the goal. Thank you. Um, we talked a lot about geopolitics. I think we covered a lot of topics. We talked, we covered NATO, but let's now zoom in on youth because today is, of course, as we said in the beginning, the uh, International Youth Day. So I would like to pose a question to all the panelists. Uh, and uh in regards to so what problems do young people face in your countries it's a it's a very big question with a lot of answers in it um so alexander i see you've raised your hand please go ahead yeah um i'd like to comment on this question first um and i'd like to zoom in on i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna not talk about the obvious, which is the low wages, the emigration and the housing crisis. I think we can agree these are issues facing the youth in the majority of our countries. Uh, one unique issue that has not been addressed by the general left in Ireland, and it seems that it's other left-wing organizations are slow to pick up on it, is the issue of the drugs and addiction crisis. Dublin at the moment, Belfast and Cork are being ravaged by crack cocaine, fentanyl uh, addiction issues. Um, ultimately, the way it's playing out is that everybody in Ireland consumes drugs. It's no longer a taboo issue. All the statistics show that as far as judges and politicians, drugs are consumed in a widespread manner. But there are the consequences and the manner in which they obtain their drugs are all outsourced to working class areas. So it's not the son of a judge who is faced with intimidation, for example, because he has a death, because he has addiction issues. It is a young person in a working class area that faces the consequences of that. And I think in order to address the other socioeconomic issues, we need to seriously look at how we address the drugs and addiction crisis politically. Uh, what is our analysis of it? Uh, I understand that socialist countries in the past had a much more almost rigorous and criminalization orientated approach to addicts. Research from contemporary times and the practical implementation in countries like Switzerland or Portugal or areas in Canada shows that a more compassionate and more health-led approach is actually more successful. Uh, it, often it's cited that in Finland, the manner in which they resolve issues that are connected to homelessness and addiction is that they provide housing. 
this seems like a very practical position to take from the perspective of a communist organization and a communist youth organization. Um, as it stands, the way it works here is that young people, in particular boys and young men, are sucked into drugs gangs. They do the dirty work of drugs gangs for easy money. They end up, for the most part, getting caught or getting killed or being chopped with a machete or any number of other issues. And this suits the state in Ireland because it keeps our class totally dysfunctional and divided. When people are more worried about this in their road, in their estate, in their community, rather than the overarching issues that stem from capitalism, they don't have time to focus on those things because you have the existential issue that one of your family members or one of your neighbors or somebody on your road is either some sort of drug fueled maniac or an addict that they need to look out for and care. Um, so I think a very important communist intervention in 2024 and going forward has to be one that focuses on the impact of the addiction crisis for, for our youth, because it's, it's killing working class people. Our class doesn't have the magic social safety net that wealthy middle class people do. It doesn't exist. You, you die, you become homeless, you become an addict for the rest of your life. You start to commit crimes to feed your addiction. Uh, for women, it's even worse. Many turn to become prostitutes. That's that's how they feed their addiction. Single parents store drugs in their houses in order to feed their addiction as well. Those houses become crack dens or drug dens. This this is this is the lived experience of where I live. This happens all around us, um, and there is no response really from or commentary from the general left on this issue. Uh, it's just generally acknowledged it's bad. So that's that's the issue I'd like to leave in your minds to consider uh, and maybe think about as a as a different issue that's maybe not talked about as much, but as important for the youth. Uh, thank you, Alex. I think I can uh, re uh, somewhat relate to you on that topic. It is it's discussed among colleagues uh, where I work. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely an issue that is still somewhat on, under the radar uh, of official st uh, statistics and uh, but it is a problem that people are more and more noticing and are commenting especially about the youth so thank you for bringing up this important issue um, I'm going to now move on to uh, comrade Lupu uh, here in Macedonia and Romania we have some similarities in terms of our history that we are uh, post-socialist countries. Uh, we are, after all, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and I often find that uh, people from Eastern Europe sort of share the problems uh, that they have. Could you tell us a little bit more uh, about, uh, specifically about Romania, and then we're going to go on to Todor to tell us uh, about Macedonia and see how if, if, if we can compare Romania and Macedonia at all. Sure. Uh, so Alexander raised uh, actually what was my my most important question or problem as well. In Romania, um, most of the, the the youth, at least if it's if they don't consume drugs regularly, they have at least tried once to do that. Um, this is because some drugs are being transported through here to the to the continent from Tur from Turkey or from Georgia. Uh, from Georgia we get cannabis. From Turkey we get cocaine and other amphetamines. Um, so yeah, this is pretty pretty harsh on on us as well. The the worst problem about this is that the the state. Um, even even my my party, not the youth wing, but the main party, they have a very rigid approach when it comes to to drug uh, to drug addiction. They treat it uh, uh, like it's a it's a crime with a victim. Like uh, they are they're, they're very rush or harsh with with what they propose. So both my party and the Romanian state, uh, our drug laws are very very. Uh, punitive it's uh, it's up to 15 years for traffic and up uh, up to seven years uh, jail time for uh, even possessing uh, 
thankfully consumption itself isn't yet out of the law uh, if if it was they would uh, we wouldn't fit in in the jails um so yeah this is uh what what i i think is our problem with this is uh in my experience when i was in school for example um there i, I there were some sessions where uh, my school brought people to talk with kids about drugs and it wasn't uh, psychologists it wasn't uh, pharm pharmacologists uh, it wasn't anybody that would you know paint the the picture like it it should be painted for kids to for rebellious kids to understand and uh, avoid risks uh, most of the time it was the police they came they only told us that uh, a, a puff of uh, cannabis will kill you instantly and uh, i i cannot blame the the kids for choosing to not listen to such idiotic drivel and actually try it themselves uh, the worst part is that this lie and uh, the proof uh, against it uh, leads a lot of young people to to uh, take a habit in taking drugs um, this uh, this is also goes hand in hand with uh, the other uh, our most fragrant issues which is uh, the there is a, a a very sharp line where uh, the the youth the young people and the old people in this country come from two different worlds the older people have learned russian in school while we learn english uh, some some of our newer generations never lived without a phone while uh, our parents still struggle using one uh, so I think that both generations recognize that there is a problem, but they don't see that the problem, in my opinion, is caused specifically or most extremely by this uh, schism between the generations. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we can amend any issue, not just the drug uh, problem. If uh, if what what usually happens is young people consider older people to be just nostalgics like uh, no communist implications just nostalgia about the young days while the old people think of the new people as uh, drug addicted uh, you know hedonist uh, idiots um which is in my opinion partly true in both cases but we ca we can't we can't uh, we can't uh, report between each other like this this is not a healthy way to to relate uh, so this is the second problem. The third problem is that young people, unfortunately, have, there have been studies made about political uh, leaning, for example, and the studies have shown that uh, most of the young people have left leaning principles, but they report that their identity is right leaning. So uh, my the the gross not just the youth most people here are uh, illiterate when it comes to politics they are also very bad when it comes to to money handling money they don't know in what to invest usually they get scammed by uh, by things that we we wouldn't get uh, scammed by probably like facebook uh, commercials or things like that and uh, there's also a lack of meaningful opportunities which I think alienates the youth from uh, what the old people think life should be should be lived uh, like uh and in general yeah that's uh, that's all I got thank you Robin. Todor uh Macedonia we are also part of this post socialist community but it seems that uh more and more we're talking about new problems that the, the youth is facing um could you maybe give us some examples of uh, what's happening here in macedonia some of yeah problems? the biggest problem that the youth faces in macedonia is a system that isn't working and in fact treats them as, as his burden and not his future this is a consequence of neoliberal capitalism and the corruption that comes naturally with that and uh, the other main problem that young people face here 
is uh, not good uh, job opportunities. Many of them work illegally uh, without labor rights, benefits and health insurance and without any protection from the system, which has a duty to protect them in every way. Uh, a lot of the the new the new economy, which is from the West, is basically a call center economy. It doesn't have a real production of of value, and it's foreign markets or, oriented. So nothing is left uh, here of the capital that it's produced. Uh, a fraction of a percent, may, maybe. So the, the, other, the other problems are from education or the lack thereof, because in the past 30 years, as we moved to a trans transition to a capitalist system, or I would like to say the correct way, neoliberalism, neoliberalist capitalist system, uh, the, the, we have a steady decline in the quality of education uh, and our university are lower and lower on the ranks in comparison to the to the other ones in the world and uh, I think that uh, the the system is uh, is uh, it's, it's like in a way creating a, a people, young people that can't support themselves, they can't think uh, critically about the systems, and this is in a way this is a modern day slavery from the media which uh, dominates them culturally to the economy and on top of that uh, the military stuff with nato we are under total occupation basically from mind to body and everything in between thank you um thank you Tor. i know about italy there is a division so north italy and south italy uh south italy is usually characterized as a uh, more underdeveloped um and the north is characterized as more industrialized uh do young people face different sorts of problems in these different parts of italy or is there something that we can say that uh, young people face uh, similarly across italy Yes, it's true. We have a lot of uh, difference between uh, the north of Italy and south of Italy. I'm from a region of the south of Italy, it's the island of Sardinia, and Marco is uh, from north of Italy. From Trieste. From Trieste. So, yes, uh, it's true. And uh, you say that the north is more industrialized than the sur. Uh, it's not totally true because uh, uh, now uh, in the last year uh, we have a, a, a big uh, industrialization of our. Uh, yes. uh, this, 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 this maybe was true uh, yes. uh, some uh, some decades uh, ago. Ago yes, but now the, the industrialization uh, beat uh, uh, a lot in our nation. So the north is more. Uh, uh, take the place of the industry, the, the, the financial economy. And the South uh, is uh, in a uh, situation yes, of tourism and uh, economic depression in general. So a lot of uh, uh, young people from the South have to go in the North or in the North of Europe to find a job and uh, live the life. Because or to study. It, yes, because we uh, live in a situation where in the, uh, the winter you, you can't uh, find a job and only in the summer for a very short period during the, the uh, tourism period. So the situation is in Italy is that. It's for this region that we uh, promote a uh, movement from the, uh, for the reindustrialization of our uh, land 
that is very important because uh, in these uh, years of the tourism economy and in the thought and in the uh, financial economy in the north, our uh, salary uh, begin uh, all the time uh, less and, uh, and people uh, are more poor than first. Uh, so, uh, and uh, maybe you know this, uh, we are the only uh, state in the European uh, Union uh, that the, our salary is uh, uh, less than lower, lower than uh, 10 years ago. So, uh, the situation uh, of economy in Italy is that. Yes, the, the political and the economic situation in Italy is very, uh, is very critical. Uh, a lot of um, young people from Italy are forced to escape in Northern Europe and in other parts of the continent because, uh, uh, as Samuel uh, have already uh, said, in Italy it's very difficult to find a good job. The only job you can find is a stagional and very low salary job. And, uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to remain in Italy because our government is uh, extremely neoliberal. They close a lot of uh, factory. They close a lot of working place. They sell everything. They want to privatize everything. And our political system want to transform Italy in a, only a tourist nation. We have a, we have a very similar situation. Uh, like the Croatian comrades, uh, because also uh, their country are becoming uh, a only tourist economy. This is very uh, critical and dramatic, <laughs> because uh, you can't live uh, with, the, with the tourist industry, because it is a very poor industry. In Italy, it is, it is difficult to find a job, to study, and uh, our government is uh, uh, also find a, a house in the city. Yes, we find a house because uh, for the mass tourism, the price of the uh, houses in the city they are very high. They are very high, but the salary is very low. Low. So the so the uh, living city, living the big city in Italy, now it is impossible. Uh, for example, a lot of people that work in Milan, in Florence, or Rome, they live in the. Uh, more um, eastern uh, uh, from the more uh, they live out of the city and uh, every day they go in the city for work they take uh, uh, I don't know uh, two hours of uh, train a day three hours of train a day for arrive and for go back so uh, six hour uh, a day in the in the train. We can see uh, like a uh, true movement of return uh, in countryside of the young people in particular, because it's very difficult uh, for Italian people <laughs> live in the center of the city. So for this, we are promoting a uh, neo-industrial politics. We are promoting a uh, uh, politics politics to defend the working place against the. Uh, the truest economic style because we want our uh, young people to study and to have a good and uh, um, uh, and, and empower job uh, so we are trying to defend our industry and our economy but the situation is very uh, difficult because all the parliament want to sell uh, uh, the economic of the of the country yes um, uh, also uh, this situation is closely uh, related with uh, the international situation because the united states uh, want to uh, take our uh, um, system industry. Uh, yeah the industry uh, system of uh, production and put that in the united states for uh, enforce uh, uh, the, the they, economy. They call, yes, their the, production, production. Uh, for do war against China and Russia, and so we can see that uh, very clearly. Um, and Yardar, uh, tell us about Norway. So Norway, you mentioned that it's the richest, one of the richest countries in the world. Um, it feels like it's impossible for young people there to have 
uh, problems. So could you could you tell us a little bit, give us a little bit of an insight into Norway and uh, the obstacles you know, the youth is facing there? Yeah, as you say, it feels like it's impossible to have any problems. Uh, but sadly, we have quite a lot of problems, especially when it comes to youth in Norway. Um, as I was talking about earlier today, we have a, quite a lot of wealth. Uh, we have a sovereign wealth fund that uh, at, currently it's about $1.6 trillion dollars. And uh, yeah, as I said, we had one point and a half, uh, one and a half point, one point five percent of all of the stocks in the world, two and a half percent of all of the stocks of the traded companies in Europe. Problem is that that fund is not Norway. It is owned by the Norwegian state, but the money never comes to Norway. For most part of the time, there's a limit uh, at two percent that comes into Norway. Which means that our currency, for instance, uh, which should have been uh, boosted by all of the economy traded into it, uh, does not. All of it is still uh, is instead traded in euros and in dollars, uh, which means that it the the fund does better when our economy does shit, which so it looks very good on paper. Oh, the fund goes up. Uh, sadly, it doesn't help the people living in Norway, and our expenses uh, going abroad goes down. Well, compared to other countries, it's still not that bad, but during the last few years, it has been quite a big shift for people. The one part, that's one part of it. Like, for instance, uh, the Norwegian currency compared to the Danish one that used to be one-to-one -one is now that one Norwegian one is 1.6 Danish. That's quite the inflation hike between neighboring countries. Um, especially when there's no real issue with it. And the thing is that everyone is talking about how there is a, like, oh, we should uh, make the rents go up because then the inflation will get lower and whatnot. That's an idea that works with Forex trading in the 70s and all of that, but doesn't really affect the situation that we're in because we're one of the richest countries in the world actually controlling our own economy. The thing is that our central bank is selling our currency for sheep to other people and not taking in the money that we're actually making other places into the Norwegian economy. So we are doing this against ourselves, against the Norwegian population. It is done on purpose. It's the same that they do when it comes to being part of the EU. All of the directives that we are part of the EU's economic area instead of the EU, we can say no to. Uh, like, for instance, um, privatization of railroads. We could have said no, but we didn't, because it's much easier not to say no when you're already part of it. That's why we want to be outside of the economic area. There are many things that are interesting for us still that would be good, like the how how students get to go uh, through countries, having uh, some different corporations with Interrail. There's a lot of things that you could do, but we take all of the bad things from the EU instead, and that's why we don't want to be part of it. Uh, and we have a very weird form of capitalism in Norway because we say that, oh yeah, capitalism is going to die, but the, Nor uh, the Nordic model is going to survive, but it's still a capitalist society. But somehow people are thinking, oh yeah, it's one. Or like we are living in a socialist society. That's why it's very hard to say that, oh yeah, socialism is the solution in Norway because the Norwegian idea what socialism is, is very far away from what socialism should be. Um, and when it comes to the uh, things that we have extra problems with, uh, as I said, we're making this currency problem, which reflects into every other thing. For instance, when it comes to food, we are the country in the world that is the least self-sufficient. Cuba, during its 60-year-plus blockade, is more self-sufficient than Norway at the moment. We went from an agricultural society where we had uh, several hundred thousand farms until, uh, and we went down until we have less than 2% of the people working in that area. We had one third of the population working in industry, making things like fertilizer, aluminum, magnesium. Now we have less than 
And then we have 2% working in the also important oil sector that we also, because of environmental concerns, want to put down. And that's a thing, it's okay by itself. It's a, uh, it should be done something with the environmental problems with oil. The problem is that we have no solution. What should we do? That leads to 76% of the people working in some kind of sales business or some kind of uh, public administration or whatever. So we are a very vulnerable country uh, when it comes to outside influence. And we see that what, the, for instance, the um, International Society had done with the sanctions against Russia and seizing their assets abroad, if the same thing were to happen to Norway, we are fucked. Sorry for the bad language. Uh, um, but anyway, so that also affects debt. When they raise these, uh, when they raise the rates because they say that it will help with the inflation, that that makes it much harder for people to survive with the things that they have. And all of the people who think they are middle class but are really not because the banks own everything. It's just that they have sky high loans that make it look like it's theirs. So when the interest rate uh, hikes go, rates hikes, uh, then we get a lot of problems. And especially for younger people where we had so-called affordable uh, loans that were given to students, uh, which are not the best version. The Danes uh, ones are much better than ours compared to what we actually give. But we have like, uh, you get a scholarship of uh, 40%. Of, of, um, of some amount of money at the currently it's like 12,000 euros a year. Uh, 40% of that is given as a scholarship. 60% of it is given as debt. So when you're finished with a degree and most people in or like a huge amount of people in Norway have a degree now, before you have a house, before you have a car, before you have anything, you have like 50,000 euros in debt. Uh, so that also means that the prices of labor goes up as using that as an excuse and at the same time for instance uh, using the ukraine war as an excuse they hike the prices on food oh on food that had never had anything to do with ukraine no part of their supply chain whatsoever had anything to do with it and uh, it's a, the problem is that there are the same people that own uh, the food stores that also are the distributors of the food. So they just can put whatever price they want to. On it. And that is not controlled by the Norwegian state, which is very weird because the Norwegian state through the public fund, as I said, since we own so many stocks around the world, own more than half of every business in the country. Stocks of all the traded companies. You have some companies that are outside of the stock market, but still. So, it should have been one of the countries in the world where uh, some kind of state controlled revolution would be super easy. We just buy it, we control it, finished. But instead we do this to ourselves, uh, where people have uh, now in the richest country in the world, supposedly, cannot feed themselves. We have long food queues. And at the same time, we had some of the cheapest electricity in the world, which is very important in a country where people freeze for most of the time. Uh, because that is the primary source of heating for most. Suddenly, uh, at points of the year, it went up by 10 times. And there's no reason for it. It's, uh, we had our own electricity. We did not import electricity because we didn't need it. And because we didn't need it, they said, okay, let's electrify the cars. Let's make the oil platforms electric. They were running on gas that they were putting up themselves. Why would we make cables go over there just to use some of the land cables. Why? Because then, oh yeah, let's build a, a cable to different countries. So for instance, now Norwegian electricity is uh, powering uh, the German uh, railways and it's powering the Tesla production for, for no reason whatsoever. So they get cheaper power to drive that than the Norwegians get. It's interesting to hear that there's so much for, for a country that uh, we hear all the time that has so much wealth and is so prosperous and we often look at the often look at the uh, uh, how was it uh, average wage average income of Norway and we see like four thousand five thousand euros and we say oh man they must be living like uh, gods 
but uh, it's very interesting to hear this uh, uh, different perspective on all of these things with all these problems accumulated. Um, how in, in, in that regard, how do young people in your country perceive the communist idea? Um, the Alex mentioned earlier that uh, there is this sort of um, you ask people, do you want free public housing? Do you, uh, you you line up a whole bunch of things that are uh, sort of uh, a staple of communism and they say yes, 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 yes. And then you say to them, are you communist? And they say, no, no, no we're not. Um, how do young people perceive uh, communist, the communist idea in Norway? Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, there, there is, a, I'll get back to what I was talking to later, but uh, well, you can say that since we were an agrarian economy, we were living in the farmlands, basically, we had a, a, a duty of helping each other. There was something that came with it. And because of the Soviets being our closest neighbors and how they helped and everything, uh, in 1949, uh, the Communist Party had 11.9% of all of the votes in the country. And still, uh, after that, because of the deal we made with the U.S., we were followed. Uh, we were put under su surveillance. Uh, it was horrible. People were forced out of their work. Uh, so we became quite small, uh, like purely communists. And this was done by the party that we went out of that were supposed to be the workers' party. That party has now become the new right party. And then the right party is a little like almost the same they're just arguing with each other over small things but in one four-year period they had one single dispute that they uh, voted differently on so you can say that it's a very politically it's a very like okay we don't like communists because that's the the idea of everyone has been forced fed and people have that very weird ideology uh indoctrination now that people don't know the difference between a communist and a nazi in a way but then suddenly uh in the uh, the, the last few years there has come uh, another like leftist party that somehow were mistaken as being communists that became big enough for communists not to be looked down upon so badly because then there were suddenly parliamentarians and, and everything was like okay something so it's a bit weird how people view it uh, because of not knowing what it is. At the same time, as I said, we have a lot of people who, who believe that we are the richest country in the world or therefore everything is well, even though we have all of these problems that I outlined. Um, then people are not aware of these problems at the same time. They, they don't feel it because most of these things, people are so sheltered that the, uh, by the time they feel it themselves, there may be at least in their middle 20s, you know, uh, when they start having to repay things, when they go out, they try to find a house, see how bad the housing market is, because Norway is also one of the most expensive countries in the world to live in. Uh, so it's a, it's a, a bit difficult to, to have that class mentality. Uh, and a, a point for this, we talked about the... the uh, the drug situation, uh, for instance, in Ireland and how the lower class takes more drugs. In Norway, it's actually the, the, the ones that have higher economical standing come from better backgrounds that do more drugs. We are the third uh, like highest country when it comes to uh, cocaine use. Uh, but then again, the people who die uh, of... Uh, um, we are the, also the third highest country of people who die from addiction. And then it's the, uh, the ones who are of lower income. So we have some like very weird discrepancies between the people because people don't really see which class they are from in the same way. And you have uh, also, we have had a good economy for quite a short while because as I said, we came from an agricultural society, everything. We started actually making money out of oil uh, more or less 2000 that's when we really started making something out of it and that's not that long ago so th there's a lot of people who like incrementally remember how bad it was still have some values we have people who live in shitty cabins in the in the woods and everything and likes it uh but 
when you, you have the newer generation that hasn't had any of those issues and then suddenly they have completely different issues so we see that the youths that are growing up in these more sheltered families have much bigger problems with uh, anxiety with depression with uh, like social disorders all of those things that again fuel something that has to do with drugs very often or alcohol abuse or even suicide so there is a it's a very like weird way where people don't really know what they're going to do and they're very anxious about everything else in the world and they really want to do do something in the world but since they lack that mentality of class they put all of their effort into some specific project like okay it's good to free palestine but we don't do this for the working class and our mentality it's okay to fight for uh for lgbtq rights uh but not as part of a class mentality so like there's very there's a lot of people fighting for their little corner without seeing the whole of why things happen this is an important point in terms of raising awareness uh amongst the youth for uh for a better better class consciousness of, of course um i see that Rupu also has something uh yeah uh so uh hearing jardar uh i i remember that alexander said something uh worth mentioning and staying on a bit uh which is uh how the the left the non-communist left or maybe the communist but not allied to us left from uh, each our country treats the the problem with the drug addiction which I, from what i i can see is actually everywhere not uh, not just in the balkans uh, so i uh, be, before i i ask uh, if, uh, you guys how is it in in your country uh, for example over here we have uh, like a liberal project to decriminalize uh, cannabis to up to uh, three grams uh, drug consumption in my opinion shouldn't be criminal although it's it's uh, dangerous in the in most hands uh, people shouldn't do drugs i think we all agree with this or drink alcohol for that matter um so the the liberal side is looking to to uh, avoid putting young people in jail but they they would still uh, um, keep a punishment like a fine or something like that so I wanted to ask you guys uh, how the how the, this problem is put. Yeah, Alexander, go ahead. Yeah, that's very similar to here, where the general discussion at the moment focuses on cannabis use and decriminalization of cannabis use. There are a few more more politically developed political representatives. Uh, one is from the area I live in. She's a senator called Lin Ruan, who is a former heroin addict herself, who makes some very strong and persuasive arguments that addiction has to be treated with a compassionate health led approach and that the imprisonment of someone who is, for example, uh, committing crimes in order to feed their addiction doesn't actually resolve the issue of their addiction all it does is put them into prison where they will continue to access drugs and continue to be an addict um so she has quite a good political take on it drawn from her own personal experience but there's a very interesting resistance both among the civil servants and the establishment party elected representatives and whether it's rooted in social conservatism or just a generally backward, lazy view of societal problems, or, and I mean, uh, you can call me a cynic, but I, I think the state realizes that its approach to the war on drugs benefits itself. It benefits its, its monopoly on power. It benefits the police who can abuse working class people, lock people up, kick the shit out of teenagers. It guarantees that their profession remains, it guarantees that the legal profession remains, it pays the wages of very well-paid judges. 
So the cynic in me thinks that the reason they don't change policies because a lot of them would be out of a job if they decided to whole scale change policy. So in that sense, uh, yes. And I think just just to touch on the point, when I say the left, I mean, communists have had socially conservative views on drugs for a long time as well, and they continue to do so. Despite, by the way, many communists having no problem drinking palinka or vodka or puchin here in Ireland or pints um, of beer, which arguably are as bad, if not even worse, than certain uh, drugs are. So th this is both a cultural change that needs to happen, um, but also it's a very materialist one. This, this is our lived experience. This is happening all around us. If we assume the same rigid uh, and conservative position um, of the state essentially and criminalize and look down on people with addiction issues well we will be chopping off the proverbial limb which is a whole chunk of our class who have a very real and tangible problem uh, with drugs and addiction and the other thing i would say is is that um kind of on almost to the contrary of that I think cadres in particular should actually be examples of alternative and counterculture lifestyles to substance abuse. So that should include that yeah. that should place us as promoters and champions of healthy lifestyles of sport um, and of a general, I think, you know, fair enough. What people do on their own time is their own time. But the, the political world should not be a world where substance abuse is tolerated or even encouraged. And I, I know for a fact, I have attended international events. I am very familiar. Sorry, my dogs are agree, agreeing with me. Um, I am very familiar with what happens in youth organizations around the world and drink and drugs. And I think that's a problem. I think that's I think that has to be addressed in a very genuine and self-aware way uh, that political events uh, and cadres should be sober and should reflect kind of the best counterculture. Um, I suppose the best, the best elements of a counterculture. Uh, and the last point I'll make on that is that think of the Soviet Union and of all the posters about health and rejecting alcoholism and drink and drugs, you know, those things were designed for a reason. And it's because Russian society and Eastern European society had, a, had an alcohol problem. And, and still does, arguably, it's even worse since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, Ireland, by the way, one of the things you, when someone says Ireland that you think of is drink. And that's, it's, it's funny, but it's also not funny because it, it speaks to a, a chronic alcoholism within the country that's laughed off as some sort of joke. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave my point there. Right. Uh... To answer Lupu's previous question about what's what's happening here in Macedonia, I'll let Todor uh, answer on our behalf. Uh, could you go into a little bit in more depth uh, about the problems uh, in terms of well, drug use and cannabis use and so on? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you for the the opportunity. Uh, our party, the left was the first party to put its in, in, in its parliamentary program that we are for decriminalization. That was on the previous election cycle. As of this election cycle, we are for full legalization of marijuana and its pro derivative products like oil that uh, is used for uh, for medical reasons, for ca for cancer uh, uh, treatment and stuff, I basically I have in my family. My grandpa was sick of of cannabis, and uh, he was using it, and uh, it helped him a lot. Also, also for from a social and uh, cultural standpoint. We are for legalization of cannabis uh, because it's a, a social drug and it 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 uh, it's it's a lot of a lot of 
come it has a lot of common effect on the people contrary to alcohol use because uh, uh, because alcohol is uh, one of the main concerns of domestic violence uh, so uh, also i have to mention that in macedonia we have cannabis production but it's not legal it's for export purposes only and uh, none of that is for the cons con for the people for the consumer they are uh, treated by the police by the state as the biggest criminals and a lot of our uh, prisons are overcrowded for for that reasons for minor uh, cannabis use related crimes which is a a huge issue for us because uh, they are many uh, dead space in the prison and it's needed for for more serious crimes uh, and uh, i'm talking about use uh, using cannabis not abusing it there is a difference we we think that cannabis uh, should be legal for persons over the age of 18 with uh, special dispensaries and not everyone like little kids and stuff can can buy it thank you thank you Todor, for uh describing the situation in macedonia i see yarda you have uh, your hand up sorry i didn't notice it go ahead well our situation is quite different uh both because you know Karl Marx said religion is opium for the people and it would be very weird to put more opium into the people. Uh, so it is it is quite a difficult thing to say that you should decriminalize something that is a problem because it's a problem for the justice system to do something about. Uh, it's more of uh, trying to fix the different problems that makes people at least abuse it. One thing is using it, as you said, in a way, but, but, but another is abusing it. And for instance, people in the, the reason why we had a split in our party can actually be more or less described back to people smoking too much and not really knowing what they were doing and talking out of their in uh, international situations. So it's a very difficult thing especially in uh, a setting where you have a political responsibility and where you have a lot of people that have difficulties coming to you especially ex-drug addicts especially like people uh, who come from that background where they see that this has been a problem no matter if it's alcohol no matter if it's uh, uh, substance abuse whatever so therefore it's a problem and in Norway you can say that one of the biggest problems is that people feel alone for some reason it says that we're not one of the worst countries in the world but we still have like over 40 percent of the population like they feel alone they feel lonely and it's particularly bad among students so people have that thing about like what should they fill this with and you have the same when it comes to over excessive drinking we don't have that uh like for adults for people above the at least the age of 18 above 20 somewhere there until they are pensioners we don't have those things that can actually take care of you there's no good school system maybe if you go to university but then you will be put into more drinking more of those things that are happening the social things that are happening are more focused on parties than they are on actually doing something else there are some uh, universities in norway that have are slightly different but still like the things that uh, you have when you're a kid all of the different sports that you can do all of the different uh, like play an instrument uh, be part of something a theater group whatever they doesn't exist so we have we have like there's a there's an empty space that is being filled by many people with drugs at parties in that kind of culture and for instance one of the biggest problems with uh, putting into more marijuana and that's a situation especially like marijuana is that we're uh, we haven't decided anything our party towards this, but there is a thing in the country going where you want a generational ban on smoking because of bad health. 
So there would be like, oh yeah, you should ban smoking, but it should be allowed with marijuana. So there are there's a lot of things that are clashing. And as they said, when they're legalized things in uh, in Portugal, is that if you just legalize something, it won't really make a difference. What you have to do are all the other things around to keep people like to make them feel wanted, to make something do something with the problem. Because if you just legalize them to forget the problem, that is right side ideology. It's all of different things. You can talk about whether or not you should legalize it, but at least what you have to do is take care of the people. Both while it's illegal, uh, like it doesn't matter if it's illegal or if it's um, if it's legal, you should still have some kind of mechanism taking care of these people. This is an interesting. Uh, this is an interesting perspective you bring uh, forward. Um, maybe uh, Samuel and Marco have something additional to say on that, or it's something different. Keep in mind, uh, after your answer, we will be going to the last question, and we will be slowly wrapping up. But yes. uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, in Italy, the situation with drugs is uh, very critical because in Italy we have a uh, uh, problem with the mafia system. And the mafia system work a lot with the uh, drugs traffic. Our party is for uh, legalization and uh, for uh, um, conscient uh, depenalization. Uh, depenalization of the use. And because we want to take away this market uh, from the, the mafia system, because uh, it is a very uh, huge part of the mafia traffic. traffic the drug, the lack of course that we are talking about uh, like uh, drugs so uh, marijuana and uh, because it's very a uh, big part of the of the mafia uh, economic uh, traffic and economic uh, uh, politics and uh, so it is a very uh, uh, important situation for example in the uh, south of the of Italy where uh, um, this traffic is uh, is very important as they traffic uh, it uh, with the entire part of the world. So the market, so the market, the drug market of the mafia is very uh, huge. We want to uh, applicate uh, to use a uh, um, depenalization uh, politics and uh, regularization uh, politics uh, for arrive to a. Uh, um, Mm. Uh, to arrive uh, 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 one uh, responsibility use of uh, of the uh, uh, substance uh, to take away this, tra this traffic uh, from the from the mafia. Uh, but sorry, uh, we have to um, to to go because we have another uh, meeting. Uh, we have to to go away. Uh, yes, we have to attend this meeting. Uh, we want to thank you very much for this invitation and for this uh, opportunity to discuss together to a lot of uh, topics, internal and international. Uh, so we are, very, we are very glad to take part of these uh, conferences. Thank you very much from all of our organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel and Marco. It was a pleasure having you here. Uh, I wish you well and uh, see you on another occasion. Now to sort of mark, to, to give you your, this final question and I invite anybody who would like to answer it to answer it. Um, as bearers of the communist idea, how can young people unite in the spirit of internationalism and anti-imperialism? I would like to answer that question, if I may. Yes, go ahead, Dodo. Macedonia is a country with socialist past, but uh, with uh, Levica and Crvena Mladina, it has a socialist future. Macedonia, the Republic of Macedonia, to be exact, was created in the struggle against fascism in the Second World War. Our grandparents were communists and partisans. Uh, 
the quality of life in Yugoslavia was much better than uh, than right now. It was one of the most uh, it was the top ten developed countries in Europe. Uh, that is not uh, only a story that our grandparents were were telling us, but it was it is by Human Development in Index. And now Macedonia is in rank with Sub-Saharan Africa, which was exploited for many centuries by Western imperialists. But also, that is a uh, fertile ground for spreading the ideas of socialism and communism. We are on a, I think we are on a great path uh, to achieve this. Uh, and uh, I, I welcome you to join us in our struggle. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Yarlar. Uh, we see a situation in the world now which is scary, to say the least. Uh, we see the, what's happening in Ukraine. We see what's happening to all different countries in the Middle East. We see what's happening, uh, or at least is supposedly planned by the Americans uh, towards Taiwan uh, and the situation there. So we see some kind of world war, some kind of happening. We have also already seen the economic, economic and uh, social issues coming from the relatively local conflict of the Ukraine war. This is going to be one of those moments where things either go left or they go right. We see the when it comes to the last European elections, we saw that there are a lot of people going right. We see Donald Trump also going even more right, even though Biden wasn't really the best president at all for his country. There's still, we see these things where we are losing. One thing is that the communists are not forward enough, but another is that the, the entire divide about if you go left or you go right is still like creeping towards the right. So we have a responsibility of actually doing something, taking care of that, uh, like be there in the situation and trying our best to push it. So we have to somehow make uh, an international cooperation, which is not just talk. Somehow find ways to work together that can transcend borders. With the people who have some kind of connection to the EU, you have some, uh, there is some kind of in regulation where you can be put in. Like you have the, what we would call Euro communists and all of that, uh, that have this, strategy but at least they talk together at some point they have some kind of actual like voting together but the rest of us don't like if you're gonna like have some kind of cooperation between borders that doesn't have any legislation between them how do you cooperate uh so the sharing of skill sets the sharing of for instance uh, social media things uh, uh any kind of graphical design skills pictures news all of that is very important to get it out somehow. Making that kind of actual networking work. Another thing is if you're big enough, if you have the kind of, into, when it comes to workers union, you have some actual power to do something, some demonstration, you can do something, but it's still in the small things. Even the smaller organizations on the left, which have some of these skill sets that can somehow transcend borders, they build companies, Fortune 500 companies work in that way. So it should be possible to somehow build up uh, like this tra border transitional cooperation that could do something, actually making some kind of way to affect people, not only as, okay, we talk about this, we agree, but what's going to happen? So th there is work to be done in Europe, especially after the dissolution of the initiative by the KKE, uh, to what how can communists in Europe, how can left parties together with communist workers, parties, all that do something to actually pull this in the right, uh, like in not the right direction, but in the right direction towards the left. Uh, thank you very much, 
uh, for your input. Um, what I could conclude from today's discussion is that uh, young people across Europe, I can say, because we're all representatives from countries from Europe, are facing new types of issues um, with a world which is which has become very hostile uh, towards change. Um, uh, we are we are faced with uh, the immediate task of uh, defeating something that is so much larger than us uh, and so much more powerful than us and we feel like the only thing we have is our own two hands well this is not the case we have each other this is I... the most important part we have to organize uh, we have to uh, talk to each other and uh, coordinate our actions so that we can leave a better world uh, behind. Todor, can you, you had something to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that uh, through cooperation and exchange of experience as well as innovation in the communication with the masses, we can achieve through political mobilization. Thank you. Um, well, comrades, if you uh, do not have anything to add to this uh, conversation and to this panel, um, I would like to thank you for your uh, for your input, for your presence and your initiative in this. Uh, I would like you to take away something from this panel discussion that we had today, uh, maybe a new uh, view on a certain issue uh for me it's certainly uh the drug problem the youth is facing today um and i wish for you luck in your uh future endeavors and political struggles struggles thank you very much again i wish you a pleasant evening and uh take care everyone thank you for having me take care Thank you, comrades. Have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Nice to talk to you all. We'll probably keep in touch. Keep in touch. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.